Hey, GearHeads, Jeff with Gear Report here at the Project Humvee Battle Wagon. What I'm going to do today is walk through all the gear that Brand sent in for us to use at Philmont Scout Ranch. I'll go through everything that was in my pack. I'll hit some highlights of things that were in our man's pack. Uh, but we're going to give you the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Stay with us. Backpacking at Philmont is like backpacking anywhere with, with a few exceptions, okay? So what we're gonna cover in this video, it, it talks specifically about our experience at Philmont Scout Ranch while we were backpacking. We were there for 12 days. 11 of those days were in the field, living out of the backpacks with the gear that we have. For the most part, what we're talking about is gonna to apply to any kind of backpacking you do. There are some exceptions where Philmont does things differently, and I'll tell you about those as we get to them. But for now, let's dive into the gear and we'll start with Philmont is in New Mexico. So no matter what type of backpacking trip you're on, you got to get to the trailhead. If you're taking a flight, I saw a number of people in the airport that had backpacks that they just picked up off of the luggage carousel after their flight and took off. To me, that was a little too risky. You know, I was going to live out of that pack for 100 miles of backpacking in the mountains. I didn't want anything to get damaged by folks who load and unload the aircraft or, or anything else along the way. So I opted to put my bag in another bag. Now initially I was gonna use the Snug Pack Kit Monster. As it turned out, I could almost fit my pack in there. And it has backpack straps on this bag, uh, as well as a shoulder strap. Uh, so it was going to be you know, a little easier than carrying something with just a, a regular handle. And then at the very last minute, you know, a couple hours before we left, it occurred to me that we had these big uh, wheel bags, you know, roller bags, to take on airline flights. They got wheels at the bottom, handle that pulls out at the top. This one actually looks kind of like a duffel bag. Let me show you what's in here. Uh, I highly recommend that whatever you do, uh, I saw crews and troops that had printed bags just for travel, you know, like a nylon or polyester sack that was oversized and had their crew information printed on it. And they just stuck their backpack in there and took it to the airport. Um, I'm sure that protected their bags reasonably well, but it would have been kind of cumbersome, I think, to, to haul the bags around the airport like that. And especially we went through Denver. Denver's, you know, geographically the largest airport in the country is what I'm told. So a lot of walking around. I wouldn't want to I wouldn't have wanted to carry that bag as well as my carry-on. It was nice to have a roller bag that I could pull behind me. I highly recommend you you look for something with wheels that your backpack will fit in. So uh, this is a Sea to Summit little uh, strap. I'll have to look up what it's called exactly, but uh, it's an ultralight cinch strap. You know, if you need to tie something onto your backpack, this is a very light way to do it with a little, I think this is an aluminum connector on it that fits on the end. I used it for this bag since it had a tear, but then when we got there, one of the guys in the crew identified kind of at the last minute, you know, does anyone have a strap I can use? I got something that's not fitting right. And so he took this on the trail and uh, used it the whole time as well. So it was good to have that. So let's, let's see what we have in here. I'll apologize up front. I've seen a lot of videos where people lay all the gear out on a table and they just talk about it. And I think that's fantastic. What I wanted to do was show you how it's all packed together because that's half of the puzzle. You know, what you take is part of the puzzle, but how do you fit it all together in your bag? That's another part as well. Uh, some of this is a little different than how I transported it there, and, and I'll point that out as well. So uh, I tried to keep this as close to how it was when I ca came off the trail as possible, uh, which is not necessarily how I shipped it on the airlines. So for example, the solar panel here was, was put away in my carry-on bag and not in the backpack we went on that trek. So everything fit in there pretty well. See, not a lot of extra space. I was able to put my trekking poles in there. Some spare stakes that we did not take on the trail. Soaked to use in base camp because it's kind of important. Uh, receipts from the Tooth of Time traders. Maybe we'll talk about these later. Uh, I think we will because there was one item that I kind of freaked out at the weather forecast and went and purchased at the last minute. But uh, I'll, I'll show you when we get to that one. So we'll set those aside. We'll set the roller bag aside. Definitely recommend you get one of those. 
or, or use something like that. So let's start with the pack itself. And let's see, somewhere down here under this pad is a little label that says Z-Packs. Z-Packs is, they're kind of a cottage industry ultralight backpacker company. They make some tents and they make some backpacks. This one is called the Arc Blast. This backpack is supposed to be, I think, 19.2 ounces. I got the tall version. Uh, maybe that's what pushed it up to, I think it was about 21 ounces total. So less than a pound and a half for the backpack. The rated capacity is around 28 to 30 pounds. I was pushing that. I'm pretty sure I was over it a few days and I did have some problems with it. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to do another video to, video to explain those because uh, I had a couple pieces fail on this pack and I didn't realize till the trek was almost over that it was because I had done something wrong when I adjusted it. So I'll explain that later. Um, once I corrected what I had done wrong, everything was fine. It did great the rest of the trip. Um, this pack is a, um, used to call it Cuban fiber. I think they call it Dyne Dyneema fabric, something like that. Now on the outside, I think the inside's a polyester fabric. It's kind of sandwiched together. It's waterproof. I have heard people say you don't need a pack cover with this pack because nothing's going to get you know, no, no moisture is going to get in if you have the top rolled down. I carried a pack cover anyway because for quick access items out here, I wanted them to stay dry. Even though everything is kind of bundled up here, I didn't want my stuff out here getting wet. So I had a pack cover for when it rained. Uh, this is just a little no-name thing I got off of uh, Amazon or eBay several years ago. I don't even remember. It's not quite big enough for a 60-liter pack. But what I did is I covered up from the top down and usually I'd hook it on the bottom of this pad and just cover up the things that I wanted to keep dry. I'll talk more about what those are soon. So there is the pack cover uh, and it came in a little stuff sack that you notice isn't here. What I did, I, I was looking for every chance to shave grams and ounces. So I just twisted this over and tucked Every, tuck the rest of it into that little twisted section and that's how I stored it just like that and tucked it in here so we'll set that aside let's move to some other things on the outside of the pack first get them out of the way so we can see everything that's underneath um, the hat that I wore on the trail I usually wear a visor because I like the ventilation on top um, let me set this aside the last film on track I did years ago I wore a boonie hat, you know, a military boonie hat that's, uh, I think they're mostly cotton. I'm not sure what else is in them. Ripstop nylon, maybe. I don't know. Um, they don't breathe real well. So I actively went out looking for a hat with a brim that was light and foldable. I could tuck in a pocket or whatever if I needed to that had some ventilation. So you see these panels here. And by the way, I will put a link to all the products we talk about in the description of this video. So you can go find those. This is by Tough Headwear. I got it off of Amazon. And you'll see it has a little belt piece here. I used it to tie a bandana, so two corners of the bandana. And the reason I did that is this is New Mexico where we were hiking, right? So lots of direct sun. If we weren't under tree cover while we were backpacking, we were in the blazing sun. And I was able to spread this out in the back and give some shade to the back of my neck and shoulders. And I think it helped me stay cooler and it kept the back of my neck from getting sunburned, which was important to me on the trail. Uh, maybe not the sexiest hat in the world, but when it rained, it kept the rain off of my glasses fairly well, which was important to me. Kept the sun off my face, so I never had an issue with uh, my nose. I got a big nose. Look at this. Even with, with this brim, I did a couple days put a little bit of sunscreen out on the end of my nose, maybe on my cheeks. I did get a little burnt on my arms a couple times, so definitely take the sunscreen with you. Uh, we didn't. We should have. Uh, we ended up getting some on the trail. Okay, so here, there's the hat that I wore on the trail. Very pleased with how that worked out. And it was inexpensive, like 13 bucks maybe and a dollar for a bandana. Okay, moving on from the outside of the pack. Clipped on up here, my plan was to use cotton bandanas. Take two of them on the trail. One for uh, using as a washcloth, one for using as a towel. So whenever we got to a camp that had a shower, which were, there were a few, I would be able to take a shower. So 
On the other side here, you see I have a cotton bandana hanging here, Western themed, of course, uh, since we were going out West. I, I just left this hang here and much of the time I had another one hanging from the same spot on the other shoulder strap. So I had two hanging there. If I had, if my hands were wet, if anything, I needed to wipe them off, I could do that. Um, when we got to some place with a wash basin, I could wash it out and then use that as the um, washcloth in the shower. Uh, that actually worked better than I expected for the first shower. And then I uh, came across this. It's an REI pack towel. Um, let me tell you, this thing is incredibly absorbent. I haven't weighed it, but it's, it's pretty light. I don't know exactly how light it is. Came across this on the trail. It didn't have any kind of markings saying whose it was, so I washed it and used it the rest of the trip. If it's yours, thank you for abandoning it at Clark's Fork. I used it the rest of the trek and was very happy with it. So REI, I don't know if it's branded as a pack towel or what, but uh, very pleased with this little towel that did well. Uh, the bandanas worked out okay. Uh, you may be able to guess the problem here is whenever I put my pack down, these were hanging on the, in the dirt. So I try to remember to throw them up, uh, tuck them in somewhere. If it was raining, pull them up and tuck them under the pack cover. But generally speaking, no issues. That worked out well. I liked having them out. So if I was sweaty, I could wipe off on them or whatever. But then they, they were multi-purpose. See what else we have here. The Goal Zero solar panel. You see how it was connected here? I used a carabiner on the top and then two at the bottom corners to hold it in place and that seemed to do pretty well did that the entire trip never had any issues with it coming off or anything like that this is a kind of a small panel they call it the gold zero nomad 7 solar panel it has two panels here um, I have another one from Sunjack that has four panels and I thought about taking it but this by itself was 17 ounces over a pound really would have preferred not to take that at all but i would use this on my pack to charge either this battery pack and this is from black web i was going to get an uh, anchor 10,000 milliamp hour pack from amazon but uh, as much as i love amazon they let me down and a couple days before the trek they had a sale I, I put it in the cart, purchased it because it said guaranteed delivery on July 14th. We were leaving the morning of July 15th, but you know, it, it said guaranteed. So I went ahead and ordered it. Come the 14th, I got a, a note that it would arrive on the 15th, about five, six hours after we left for the airport. Completely useless to me. So I went to Walmart, grabbed this Black Web 10,000 milliamp hour battery pack with two USB ports, uh, a low and a high. So one's like one amp and the other's two amp or something like that. And it was cheaper, actually. It was like 20 bucks where the anchor was $25. So uh, I carried this, didn't even weigh it. Don't know how much it weighs. I was afraid to weigh it because I know it's going to be heavier than the anchor. Still, most backpackers recommend that you go with the anchor. It's the lightest. This worked out pretty well. I was able to, to top it up a couple times off of the solar panel, as well as I had a small charger that I think I forgot to bring out here for the battery for the, the video camera that I carried. I'll show you that in a bit. So that's really what I did most of the time is I'd take the dead battery out of the camera, put it in the little charger, zip it up in here, clip this onto my backpack. And as we walked or when we got to camp, I'd set it out somewhere where it was facing the sun. And usually it'd take about a day to run down a camera battery and about a day to charge a battery. Uh, at least when it was sunny out. Uh, that worked great for the first six or seven days. And then we hit a few days of cloudiness and it all fell apart. To, if, if I were leaving for the trail today, instead of carrying the solar panel and one 10,000 milliamp hour battery pack, I'd probably just carry two of the Anchor 10,000 milliamp battery packs. I probably would not take the solar panel, but instead would take multiple batteries. The Anchor 10,000 milliamp battery packs are less than a pound. I think they're about eight or nine ounces. So live and learn. I could have carried twice the capacity for about the same weight as this solar panel and it would have covered my needs for the entire trip. So learn from my mistake, folks. We'll have a couple of those observations in this. All right, moving on. This pad right here is part of a Thermarest Z-Lite sleeping pad. Um, you can see 
how big it is. This section actually got ripped off by accident, it got snagged on something years ago, and uh, I just carried it like this. Uh, I used it for the first few days like this. Actually, I'm going to use it now. All right. So anytime we got to camp and I didn't want to sit on the dirt, I could sit on that pad. I later in the trek realized, you know what? I don't really need that. I don't need that much space for my butt. If I double it up, I get twice the padding and I can still sit on it and keep myself off the dirt. So uh, it was fantastic. I used it pretty much every day. While I would not recommend carrying um, a chair, personally, I think the chairs in, in the field at Philmont are silly and that the people who take them, uh, the trend I saw is they spent so much on the chair, they were so proud of the chair, they ended up sitting in the chair too much. Instead of getting up and looking around and doing things with the youth, we had a problem on some shakedown hikes with a guy with a chair wanting to sit in his chair all the time and not help with the crew any. So um, I don't like chairs. These are, they help you get a little bit more comfortable, a sit pad but they're not so comfortable that you just want to kick back and take a nap in them. I like this, a couple ounces at the most for this. Thermarest sells a Z-Lite sit pad that's about half as wide. You know, it folds up, you know, like this instead of like that and fits in a side pouch real well. Uh, one of our other adults had that and he loved it. Big fan of these, uh, even if you take a piece of closed cell foam, you know, the end of one of those $5 blue sleeping pads from Walmart, you know, cut a six or eight inch section off the end and take that. I think it'll be well worth it. Good investment. Glad I took it. All right, moving on. Oh, this, this is a buff. You get these at Philmont. I like the ones that say Philmont on them. Our man's got a yellow one that has a Philmont bull on it. These are neat because, uh, and this, this one was sent by Vessel, VSSL, little survival kit tube things. You can see some of the review videos we put up on those. There's the little promotional items a couple years ago. And uh, you know, if your neck's cold in the morning, you can put it on here, pull it up over your face. If your face is cold, if your face is okay. Most mornings when I got up, if it wasn't raining, I wore it like this just to keep my head and ears warm. You know, I don't have a lot of insulation up here. So I love the buff, very versatile, really enjoyed it. I like them, glad I took it. All right, you'll see a lot of these bags. Uh, this is the eight liter bag from Sea to Summit. It's their nano bag, very light. I believe eight liters, like 21 grams, you know, or 23 or something. It's, it's very light. I use these for a lot of things. This in the pouch here is my smellables bag. This has got all the stuff that when we get to camp, so at Philmont, bear procedures are really important. They are a lot of places where you may backpack as well. So I recommend that anything that has a scent that can attract predators, bears, coyotes, whatever, keep it separated so that you can, as soon as you get to camp, pull it out quickly, run it up in the bear bag just so it's out of the way and you don't have any issues. When we got to any new camp, or even if we did a side hike, we dropped our packs to do a hike up the tooth of time. When we did that, we took our bear bags out. They had food in them, you know, the Philmont food. We took those out and we took our smellables out and we ran all those up the bear lines so that no uh, mini bears would get into our bag or big bears for that matter uh, while we were hiking. Uh, I personally learned that lesson 27 years ago when at that same tooth of time, taking the side hike up to the peak of the tooth, uh, my brother's pack got a side pouch eaten through and the mini bear just kept going inside and tore stuff up. It was terrible. They had to bring him a new pack on the trail uh, when we got to the next base camp. So uh, you definitely want to avoid that. Have your smellables easily accessible so you can get them out quickly. Um, this is a pot holder. This was from Endure, the same company that, that represents Snug Pack in the US, represents Endure. This was part of a mess kit they sent and it was light and did well for lifting pots. So we took this on the trail. It was in, it was in the crew gear that someone else carried. So I just shoved it in there. Uh, vitamin I, ibuprofen, especially for the adults. I got a bad back. So uh, most days I took 
ibuprofen in the morning, sometimes in the evening to stay ahead of a knee issue that was developing to make sure my back didn't have issues. I didn't carry it in this bottle. I actually carried it in a Ziploc bag, but I didn't want to forget to mention it. So there it is. The other things were all in a Ziploc here. So on the trail, the, the Sea to Summit bag may have been just shoved down in the bottom or even inside. Uh, and this Ziploc was just sitting here so I could see where things were. Um, some allergy medicine and contact lenses. I actually never used the contacts, but I thought, you know, we were doing black powder shooting, we we're doing high direction shooting. I may want the contacts instead of glasses. Glasses are just lower maintenance, so I use those the whole time. And I didn't need this uh, nasal inhaler for allergies on the trip, um, which was nice. Uh, I carried a variety of extra little Ziplocs because they weigh next to nothing and I found a lot of uses for them on the trail. I yeah, wasn't a hundred of them. I may have probably had 10 total. All right, in this bag, gold bond powder. All right, this is important. I put it in my socks to keep my feet from smelling as bad as they could have been. I put it in my shoe for the same thing and also to give a little bit of friction relief when I started to get a blister on the bottom of my foot. And also, um, if you get any kind of chafing in your crotch area, you can actually sprinkle it right down in your underwear and get it down in that area where your, where your thighs are rubbing together and causing friction, and it'll help take care of that as well. Um, we didn't take any. There's something called monkey butt cream you can get to, to deal with chafing. We didn't take any of that. This did what, it, what I needed it for me. So Gold Bond, definitely recommend. This is a little one ounce travel size. Well worth the wait to carry that. Uh, I took a full size toothbrush. Our man actually cut his down to half size to save weight. Uh, I took my own little tube of toothpaste. I used about half of it. You could very easily, with a partner, our man and I could have shared this and had enough for the whole trip because you don't use a lot. You know, toothpaste is just smellable. You don't want to get it all over you. You want to use a little bit to when you brush your teeth and then you have to deal with, you know, either swallowing it or spitting it down the sump and pouring a liter, water, liter of water on top of it. So you don't use much toothpaste. Could have gotten away with one of these between the two of us. I chose to take my own. Here was my personal first aid kit had moleskin, a couple different uh, larger bandages that I did not need, a little emergency pack of toilet paper from an MRE, uh, safety pins, band-aids. I used a few of those on some uh, blisters that were forming, alcohol wipes. I used a couple of those to wipe them off. I used some Q-tips. Our man uh, had a real issue with the lack of humidity in the mountains in New Mexico, drying his nose out. He was getting nosebleeds a couple times a day. So we took some, a pack of uh, triple antibiotic ointment, like a Neosporin. It's uh, petroleum jelly based and put some on the tip of a Q-tip and had him rub it around the inside of his nose to keep it moist. And after a, a day and a half of that, his nose wasn't bleeding anymore. So good to have some Q-tips, good to have some ointment. I had some gauze pads and things in here, a variety, you know, band-aids, butterfly bandages, that type of thing. That's all I carried in my personal kit. Mainly it was, it was for moleskin and, and band-aids for blisters. Uh, and then we had a crew first aid kit that had some, some bigger things in it as well. Okay, so back here, ah, that's where my patch kit for the sleeping pad was, a little tube of glue and a piece of the material for the for the inflatable sleeping pad that glue makes it a smellable so it was in the smellable bag uh, i actually had a spare tube of lip balm because i tend to lose those although i didn't lose it on this trip in case we ran into an issue i had a space blanket an emergency blanket never used that thought i may need to one night but i didn't so that was all good and that's that's pretty much what i had in here I tried to group these things by when I would use them. So I would take, and, and by the way, the meds, I had my uh, vitamins and glucosamine and the stuff that I take every day. Uh, I started out, I take four different things. So I had a bag for each one and each morning I'd have to open four bags and get one pill out of each one. I gave up on that, poured them all in one bag. And then each morning I would just open one bag and pull out the right number of each item. That worked better for me. But all of those things that I was using every morning or every evening, I put in one little bag. 
where it was easy to get to. All right. Also in my little smellable Ziploc drink mixes. All right. I put all of those together in a bag on the trail. Each of your meals will have these and you, you sometimes find them in swap boxes as well. Uh, lots of Gatorade, Kool-Aid, uh, Scratch. Wasn't a huge fan of that one. All Sport Zero. These, I don't know if they actually helped or not. A uh, couple of us adults had some altitude sickness symptoms the first couple days. All right, I think it's the, it's the altitude that I'm not thinking clearly. Yeah, yeah. Or I'm clearly yeah, not thinking. Control kind of and we were looking, we were going through swap boxes looking for this Acclimate Mountain Sport drink that's supposed to help with altitude. No idea if it did, but it made the water taste better. So you know, we put two of those in a bottle and, and drink those. I would also, in this bag, I don't have any in here right now, any snacks, any, um, you know, granola bars or stinger, honey stingers or whatever else, whatever else we had on the trail that I wanted to be able to get to quickly. Uh, if we were having a five minute pack off or pack on break, I could have someone grab this bag out, pull a bar out for me, tuck it back in there, no big deal. So that is what I had in this and i would use this sea to summit stuff sack so that when we got to camp all i had to do is roll it over and now this would clip on the carabiner to go up uh, on our oops bag line not the main bear bag line but on the the lower one that would hang off a, a lower carabiner so uh, smellable stuff highly recommend you take a lightweight personal stuff sack uh, with your name and everything on it so that it makes it really easy when you get to camp snatch it out of the bag clip it to the bear bag rope send it up you don't have to worry about it all right moving through the front pocket here for cooking oh my goodness i don't even want to get into the filmont prescribed cooking method because i i go through several phases of maybe some initial acceptance to sheer disbelief to anger to intense anger we'll just put it that way and then back to just giving up and throwing my hands up and accepting the phrase that applies to Philmont Scout Ranch their ranch their rules okay they, they own the ranch they make the rules I think the rules around cooking are ridiculous I'll, I'll be completely blunt I'll do another video at some point listing the reasons there are some very legitimate health and safety reasons that I think that their method is absolutely ridiculous but more than that it's just stupid it doesn't make any sense it's it, uh. so they want you to throw everything in a pot uh, boil some water put everything in a pot stir it up and then serve everyone out of that pot which means the pots are dirty and have to be scrubbed and you end up with little bits of stuff you have to deal with and everyone has to have something to eat off of. They want you to take some form of mess kit. So what I took, this is from Fossils, okay? Fossils, Fossils, I don't know. It is a sheet of plastic that's flat and it has some buttons in the corners. These are like origami. You know, you fold the corners up and you get, in this case, kind of a, flat bowl, a big plate with tall sides, I don't know what you call it, but this was great on the trail because it weighed next to nothing. When we were done eating, if there's anything on the plate, it was pretty easy to open it up and just lick it clean. Once it was completely licked clean, then you know the person washing the plates and stuff afterwards had almost nothing to deal with. They didn't have food particles to deal with. And you know, I, I know some people don't like the idea of licking their stuff clean, but uh, for safety reasons, for bear protocols, to keep predators and, and other um, scavengers out of camp, it really is important that you don't get bits of food everywhere. And licking your plate clean is a good way to be sure that all the stuff on the plate, none of it ends up on the ground where it's gonna attract animals or cause the people at Philmont, or if you're just backpacking, any problems. So I love this. And it was great that uh, when it came time to wash it, it was already licked clean, you know, put it in, rub it real quick, rinse it. Um, when we were ready to cook the next time, we boil the water and sterilize them. And you don't have to have a huge pot to kind of roll this up, dip half of it in the water, flip it over, dip half in the water. Now it's sterilized, you know, from dipped in the boiling water. Absolutely love these. I carried this one. I got a three pack off of Amazon. Our man carried, uh, I think he carried the one that was shaped like a bowl. And then the cup 
we left at home. The bowl was the same size sheet of plastic, just with different folds in it, so it was a little taller, but uh, worked great for him as well. Um, often in this pouch, I would have my Sea to Summit ultralight long spork attached to it like this, clipped to one of the holes in the corner. Uh, this is fantastic. A lot of the food that they give you at Philmont is in bags. And while they tell you to pour everything from the bag in a pot and rehydrate it there, uh, that means then you have to clean the pot, which I think is ridiculous. Why? All we need to do is boil water, pour it in the bag the food came in to rehydrate it. Um, we did that quite a bit. And then this long spork was great for getting down to the bottom of the bag to get the food out. I'd been using the aluminum Sea to Summit spork the regular version is about that tall for years, and it just wasn't long enough to reach the bottom. So Sea to Summit sent us a pair of these. Uh, unfortunately, our man uh, lost his a couple days into the trek, but uh, you see mine remained. Very pleased with that. Highly recommended. Uh, speaking of Sea to Summit, they also sent us some cook gear, some cook kit stuff. So Philmont didn't allow you to take the collapsible like this with the silicone on the sides. And uh, Sea to Summit, they sent... I think I have them here, yes. Some of these, these are awesome. These are uh, collapsible cook kits, the uh, X-Pot. And just real quick, it pops up. This is a four, uh, four liter pot, four quart, I don't remember. I think it's four liter. And there's nesting, there's plates and bowls and another smaller pot in here and they have a lid. They're fantastic. And I'd love to take these, but Philmont does not allow them. And uh, two big reasons. One is that the silicone absorbs scent, so it becomes a smellable. It has to go up in the bear bag, which is a pain in the butt. And the other is critters like to chew on them. So many bears will eat straight through the side of the pot. So we couldn't afford to be in the back country and have a critter chew through one of these pots and then not have a pot to boil water. So even if they would have let us take them, I'm not sure we would have taken them. I will likely use these on backpacking trips, just not at Philmont, because they have such an intense rodent problem. You know, the squirrels and chipmunks and various other things that they refer to as mini bears. So cooking stuff there. We ended up carrying for our crew the two big eight quart aluminum pots and that makes me angry. Yeah, I feel it. My blood pressure just went up at the thought of even having to take them because it is, it, it's absurd. But that's gonna be another video. So I'm not gonna ruin that one. For lighting, I took one primary light and uh, it's this one from Black Diamond. It's the Ion. This is the older version. It's a little bit lighter. The new one is brighter. I think this one was 80 lumens and the new one's 100 lumens. The new one is five or 10 grams heavier. It uses two AAA batteries. So in my Smellables bag, there were, I actually had three AAA batteries because uh, our man's headlamp from Endure can use three. So I carried the spares. I figured neither one of us would need them if we used good light discipline, just didn't leave the light on all the time. Turned it on when we needed it, turned it on the low intensity, as low as possible when we needed it, and we'd be good. You see with this Black Diamond Ion, it has a touch control. It's not a button, it's a little metal pad that as you move your finger across it, works perfectly most of the trek towards the end of the trek I had some trouble getting it to come on uh, at one point I still don't know why um, it's supposed to be waterproof I don't think that's what the problem was but I get the red light to come on I couldn't get the couldn't get it to shut off couldn't get the the white light to come on there that that last time I tried to use it actually that was in base camp that I couldn't get it to work uh, when we got back but uh, you see when you're on white the rest of the trek it worked great um, when you're on white you can hold your finger over that touchpad and it goes down to the lowest intensity. It'll blink to let you know it's there, comes back up to the highest intensity. It'll keep cycling back and forth as long as you hold it. But so when I turn it on, you know, you turn it on, it comes up to the high intensity. I'd put it on there and then depending on what I was doing, most of the time I'd immediately reach up and touch it and just turn the intensity down to have just enough light to do what I was, what I needed. And my whole goal there was to preserve battery life and it worked fantastic. So it's light, it's got a nice comfortable strap. I'd wear it here with my hat on top of it so it's under the brim and it worked great. In the tent, I would set it up in the little gear loft thing up above uh, on the lowest setting to give me enough light to get things set up and do what I needed. 
Um, very happy with it on the trail, like I said. Uh, and I think it may be the batteries are low and that's why it wasn't working in base camp, but they lasted the whole trip, so I was happy with that. Um, here, as one of the adults on the trek, I had some medical form stuff in here, a couple cheat sheets that I found online with top um, wilderness first aid scenario solutions and a patient assessment, a focused spine assessment, uh, how to recognize and treat shock, CPR, abdominal evacuation, head brain injury evacuation, diabetes issues. That's just one side. There's other stuff on the other. There's a soap form in here as well. So if you, uh, if we had to evacuate someone, film on the sectional trail map maps has a section where you can mark on the map where the person is and fill out the critical details of that person, kind of like a soap form. I didn't know that, so I have my own with me. Never needed this, but I left it visible in this pouch. It was always the last thing here in the back. So if there was ever any issue, someone could grab it for me. And I'd actually hoped to get all of our soap forms pre-filled out so that if anyone had an issue, we could grab theirs out of the pack and write all the details of their injury and treatment and whatever on it uh, and save some time, but never got to that. But I still recommend the cheat sheet and uh, having a soap form with you. Also in here, I had this uh, and I clipped it on so I wouldn't lose it. More than once I was hiking and felt it swinging around where it had gotten out of the pack. This is a poncho from uh, my trail company. They call it the, what is it, the UL Poncho Tarp. It is an ultra lightweight silicon impreg impregnated uh, ripstop nylon. Um, I like ponchos. I know a lot of people uh, today uh, like rain suits and our man carried a frog togs up uh, upper and lower you know, top and bottom rain suit and he was mostly pleased with it had a, had a couple issues where his nose was bleeding one day and it got on the front and we had to scrub the blood off and you know sanitize it and that seemed to impact the uh, the, the Purell on it seemed to impact the waterproofness in the front for the rest of the trip but uh, otherwise he was pleased with that I was pleased with this I really like that if it started raining when we were packing, I could get someone to hand this to me out of the back of my bag, throw it on over me and over the backpack and never have to take my pack off. Everyone who had rain suits, even if they just wanted to wear the jacket, they had to take their pack off to put the jacket on and then put the pack back on. So I love that with a poncho, uh, I didn't have that issue. Uh, it is a poncho tarp. So it has tie outs on the corners in the middle. If anything happened to my tent or someone else's, we had a backup tarp here. I appreciated that it's small, but in a, in a pinch it would have helped. I actually used this two nights when we were at higher altitude and it was colder. Instead of getting the space blanket, the emergency blanket out, I got this out and just draped it over my sleeping bag. Now I had some condensation issues between this and the bag but not on me. So it helped to keep some of that heat in and keep me warm enough. Um, it did get the bag a little damp, but the bag dried out pretty quickly. So it worked out. It was maybe not ideal, but it worked. Uh, when we did have rain a couple days, this did a fantastic job of keeping me dry. And uh, something I love about a poncho is uh, same thing that you hear women say about skirts or, or you know, people who like to use a hiking kilt will tell you um, that all of those give you pretty good ventilation, uh, air ventilation up underneath. So if I got warm, if I got hot and stuffy wearing this on a hot day when it was raining, I just lift my arms up a little bit and it would lift it up and, and give me some ventilation underneath and I was fine. Where people in a rain suit really didn't have that option. So I highly recommend this. Uh, there will be a link in the description to go to my trail company if you want to get one of these. Um, let's bring the poncho back. They've kind of gone out of favor with a lot of people. I like them and this is light. I think uh, it was like seven ounces less than eight ounces, whereas the uh, frog togs, I think was 12 or 14 ounces for the top and bottom. So it was lighter, it was more comfortable, more flexible, multi-use. I love it, highly recommend that. Um, here, <clears throat> we got two of these. I put them on a drawstring. This is called the Deuce of Spades. Uh, 
something you have to do when you're in the, in, uh, the back country uh, when it's time to poo. All right, it's something they do at Philmont early in a trek as they break down the resistance that people have to talking about going to the bathroom because we need to monitor urine to see if it's getting yellow or, or brown where someone's severely dehydrated. So we gotta be able to talk about pee and we gotta be able to talk about poo so we can monitor if anyone's getting you know, any kind of issues on the trail, like maybe they got some bad water and they have diarrhea. We don't want people keeping that secret. We talked about poo more than I'd like to admit out there, but because sometimes you can't get to a facility to go to the bathroom, you have to go while you're on the trail, you go off the trail, you dig a small hole. They teach you how to do this out there. You need a little shovel to do that. That's where this comes in. Most that I've seen, a lot of people carry the bright orange that you, you pick up anywhere, a plastic one. And those are three or four ounces or more. Uh, this is 0.6 of an ounce. And when I weighed it, it actually came in. It's labeled as 0.6, it came in a little lower. The Deuce of Spades, one of my favorite items on the trip. I only used it once, it worked fantastic. As the first person to use the Deuce of Spades, what, what do you think? Is that a good product? I think it is a good product. It's pretty light. It's it work well? Yeah. It's pretty sturdy. Yeah? It looks so. I was concerned. This is very thin aluminum. And it's rocky nastiness on the ground out there at Philmont. Um, but it dug the hole, did my business, covered everything back up, and it weighed next to nothing. Two of us in the crew had them. I got the other one back. Uh, that's why you see two here. I also had a roll of toilet paper, which... Uh, I, I did not put in here. Um, I carried a roll of toilet paper with a little bottle of Purell hand sanitizer. Those are the things I had on the outside. And I put this little piece of paper in this little, I didn't carry this on the trail, Sunbelt sunglass leash. I actually used it on my eyeglasses, so I didn't lose them. They didn't fall off. I didn't break them, you know, anything like that. I picked this up at the Tooth of Time Traders for like six bucks because uh, I forgot to bring one and was very pleased that I had it the whole trip. Uh, our man didn't want to spend the money so he found a piece of cord laying around somewhere and tied his own and he was thrilled with that. It worked well. If you wear glasses, if you have sunglasses, if you don't wear glasses you should take sunglasses definitely because it gets bright out there. Either way a strap on them will keep them from falling off uh, and getting damaged. All right that's everything on the outside everything on this side of the outside. Let's look on this side. Okay, these little aluminum carabiners for years, I mean, it's been a, 15 years probably, whenever I go to a trade show and at Boots, they have little giveaway items. If it has a little tiny carabiner on it, I'll grab it. And usually they're crap, they're garbage, but I can use them for a couple trips before they completely fall apart. I had three of them on this pack. Uh, one on this side, on the side compression strap, same place on the other, and then up here. And I use those three to hold the solar panel in place, but also things like the backcountry pass uh, that everyone at Philmont's supposed to have on their pack. Uh, we stopped at the demonstration forest exhibit there at, uh, where is it, Cathedral Rock. And since, since I own a small you know, timber tree farm, uh, it gave me one of the Philmont forestry cards as well. That was nice. I kept those clipped on here. On the side, you'll see the one item that if I could, if I could change all the stuff I took with me, I would hit the trail right now with all the stuff I carried and be okay. I'd be happy with it. You know, like I said, the, the battery packs and things, I may have done that a little bit differently ideally, but it worked, so it was okay. This I would have changed, and, and the company told me, my trail company sent me this pair of uh, Zero Shoes. Is this a size 14 sandal, backpacking sandal? It's fairly well padded on top. It's got nice traction on the bottom. They're comfortable-ish. I have been for years a Crocs guy because my feet sweat like crazy, and these let them ventilate and keep them from getting too stanky all the time. So our man took Crocs, clipped them on the side of his bag. Uh, most of the guys in our crew had Crocs for their camp shoes. Uh, I said, you know what, they sent these and these are kind of cool and they're lighter than the Crocs uh, by a couple ounces. I mean, three ounces maybe for the pair, uh, lighter than a pair of Crocs. I said, you know, three ounces isn't a big deal, but you know, I want to try these. I want to see how they work in the field. And I'll tell you, for someplace else, it probably would have been okay, but, but 
Philmont, the trails are so incredibly rocky with jagged rocks and sticks and things in various places. There is no way these should have been in my bag. Um, and they warned me, they told me, we sent them to you, but if they don't work for this trip, don't take them. Don't feel like you have to take them just to review them. And, and I heard that and I understood that. And I'm not saying they're bad. I actually like them. I wear them sometimes. Uh, just around. I usually wear Crocs, but sometimes I'll switch it up and wear these. And that's why I wanted to try them because I'd had success with them around town. You need foot protection. The Crocs have enough protection that, that around camp you won't get your feet cut up or anything. I did ding my feet up a couple times uh, wearing these around camp where I'd bump into something because I wasn't paying attention. So that's one thing I would change. I would not take the sandals I wouldn't take Tevas, I wouldn't take Chacos, wouldn't take anything like that. I would instead take a pair of Crocs as my camp shoes. All right, so also on this side, you see, I only have one of these in here. Uh, we used, most of us use smart water bottles. A couple guys used hydration bladders in their packs. And I know two of the, three people did, and two of them didn't use them all the time because it took up room in their pack. And it was a pain if they needed to refill them, they had to open their pack and get stuff out of the way so they could fill it with water and then repack everything in it. So they didn't use them very much. So I took this 3V gear hydration bladder that I had had and was thinking about taking on the trip, realized, you know, that it wasn't going to work for how I was packing things. And, and I, I also had another bladder rupture recently and our man had two of them rupture in, in our prep hike scenarios. I said, you know what, I don't want a water bag inside my pack where it can get things wet. I'm going to carry all the water on the outside. The ultralight backpacking crowd loves smart water bottles, but I have trouble reaching back and pulling them out of the pocket to drink whenever I want. It becomes, you know, I can't drink until we take a break and then someone can hand me the bottle and I drink from it and put it back and that's a pain in the butt. So what I did is I took the drinking tube off of this 3V gear hydration bladder and um, used it with a smart water bottle. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly how sophisticated I am. Standard smart water bottle, standard smart water bottle cap. I drilled a hole slightly smaller than the tube and pushed the tube through it until, you know, when it's screwed in, it touches the bottom. It's actually pulled out here, but had it so it would touch the bottom of the smart water bottle. And it worked great, except it sealed too well. And when I would suck the water out, it would collapse the bottle, which wasn't good. So I tried some one-way valves that would let air come in, but not let water leak out. And it turned out to be such a hassle trying to find the right valve. They ended up at the tip of a nail hot and just poked it through just enough to make a tiny little vent hole. And that's how I carried it. So when I would fill the bottle up, I'd leave the tube in place on my bag, fill the bottle up, I'd bring it back, put the tube in, and then turn the bottle to screw it in. And then usually when I put it in the bag, I'd have to remember to put my finger over that little vent hole. Otherwise, it would squirt water in my face as I pushed it in. But that was it. It never really leaked otherwise. I was afraid that if my bag tipped over, it would drip water. It really wasn't an issue. I was thrilled with this. And I had four smart water bottles. So I had two on this side and then two on the other side. So four liters, actually one of them was the 700 milliliter bottle. So 3.7 liters. And at any time when we, I could drink while we're walking through the tube that I put a little Velcro loop here to, to hold that in place. So while, while I was hiking, I could pull the tube up and drink. And then when I emptied the bottle at the next break, I would just have someone unscrew it and swap it with a bottle that still had water in it. You know, take this bottle off, put a new bottle on, and I was good to go. So that worked fantastic. Uh, I did eventually at the end of the trek learn to not let this touch the ground whenever we'd make a pack line. It took me a while to figure out that whenever we stopped, I needed to, you know, hook, hook this up here somewhere so it wouldn't drag on the ground and then put dirt in my mouth when I drank. But absolutely thrilled with this. I didn't spend 30 bucks on a hydration system. I already had the tube. And you know, if you don't have the tube and you want to do this, uh, I did go to the local big box hardware store, you know, home improvement store. The tube is a couple bucks and you can get these bite valves online for a couple bucks as well. So, 
uh, you know, two dollars. Say say you overpaid at a convenience store and pay two bucks for a smart water bottle. Four dollars in the tube setup. What's that? Six dollars. So if you have four bottles, that's eight dollars plus you know a few for less than fifteen bucks you have a pretty versatile hydration system that's durable, and none of us had any issues with smart water bottles. None of them cracked, none of them ruptured, none of them leaked, and, and we had a lot of them among the crew. So incredibly pleased about that. Very happy I did it this way. Would not change that. All right, let's look back here. On the shoulder straps, Right shoulder, I have my hydration tube. On the left strap, we already talked about the bandana and why that's there. This is a little action camera. Um, GoPro was supposed to send a couple cameras for us to use on this trek, but they had some uh, inventory issues getting the, getting the stuff out in time. So at the last second, I went and bought this uh, JVIN 4K Ultra HD action camera off of Amazon, I found it for $40, which is insane given everything that came with it. Uh, it is on an Ultrapod 2 from REI. This is something that we got uh, kind of by accident in a package deal, some used camping gear a couple years ago, and I thought, oh, it's too big and heavy, I'll never use it. But it's so stinking versatile and durable that I went ahead and carried it anyway. Uh, even though it's a little heavier than I would have liked. I probably could have gone through with a drill and Swiss cheese some of this to cut the weight, but I was too lazy. So uh, I would loosen this up to, to make it kind of like a hand holder here, you know, uh, and then a carabiner, a little aluminum carabiner I borrowed from Jarrett. So we dubbed this the Jarabiner. So the Jarabiner would sit here on my shoulder strap with the gate facing towards me, and then I would just clip this in and it took a little wiggling to get the gate to close and it would just sit there so it was there on my strap whenever i needed it i could start the camera up because it takes a few seconds to start when you hold the power button so i could start it and then go through the process of spinning it around and wiggling it out the, the carabiner so that i was able to shoot with it i actually did some video i didn't even unhook it i just left it here and pointed it around i'll tell you if you do this don't do it this way all right because as i turn it around a lot of the video the audio there's all this creaking where i can't hear it up here but apparently there's a lot of squeaking and banging and stuff going on with the carabiner hitting up on the tripod and it came through on the camera and ruin the audio on all of that. So you, you'll see some of the video where I'm walking around, it's squeak, 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 it's terrible. And it's clanging around, banging around. So don't use the carabiner, find another way. I really like clipping this to my shoulder strap and having it there where it was available very easily. Um, but I would just recommend don't use a metal carabiner find some other way to do it. If you have ideas on how to solve this, I'd love to hear it because I'm sure I'll do this in the future. Also, let's talk about the Ultrapod and the other way that I used it. Uh, Ultrapod, obviously, it's a tripod. So we did some shots where we set it down beside the trail and started it, and then everyone hiked past it, hiked to it, hiked away from it, put it low, put it high. Um, I love that this also has a Velcro strap on it. So, that allowed me to do a few things. Ah, there's some trekking poles. I found if I tried to hook it on like a selfie stick at the bottom of the trekking pole, it didn't work. It was too loose. Okay. But if I put it at the top, I could even put the strap up there, put it up here at the top and wrap it around and hook it. And there were several days where I actually carried it like this the whole day. You know, pretty much the whole day just left it strapped onto the top of the trekking pole. So then I could wrap this around a couple times and Velcro it in place. And now even while I was hiking, I'd just hike with it like this. Okay, so I'd have to pull in each hand. This one had the camera on it. When I was ready to use it, I'd just turn it on. Um, did a little video with walking like that. It didn't turn out real well. But when it's set up like this, you can also, let's see, I had it about... 44 and out at 54 is how I had it adjusted, all right? So then, the great thing about the Ultrapod, loosen this up and you have full 360 movement. You can turn it back and make it a 
selfie stick. So I got some video of it behind me, a lot of video of the camera in front of me. I even on occasion rotated it in and held it up in front of the person hiking in front of me so I could kind of get their face and everything. Sometimes without them even knowing yeah, it, that was kind of neat. Um, really love the UltraPod though. Um, and with the strap, I hooked it to a tree once or twice similar to this so we could hike past it or set it up in the campsite, you know, strapped it onto something. So if you're gonna carry an action camera or even a small camera that will fit on a tripod, I, I actually really recommend this, the UltraPod uh, because it's durable or something similar. Uh, I'd love to hear if there's a lighter one out there. This is the UltraPod 2. Maybe they have a lighter version that I could have gotten. All right, so we got the camera here. We'll talk about the camera real quick. I'll probably do a separate review on the camera pretty soon. Um, mixed bag here. If you watched our pre-trek gear video, I shot that actually sitting on the picnic table beside the, the standard photo bench that they use there at Philmont, and they've used it for decades. Um, with the tooth of time in the background. I set up the camera so that I had the tooth in the background while I was doing the pre-trek gear review. And when I went back and watched the video, I realized the audio is pretty bad. Hey, gearheads, Jeff with Gear Report. I'm here at Philmont Scout Ranch, one of the... So I apologize for that. It's as good as we could get out of this little camera. Um, other things about this camera that I like though, it'll shoot 4K, it looks pretty good. It'll do uh, high speed, uh, 120 frames per second at 720p. So I'm able to run slow motion back at one quarter of the normal speed. Really cool, doesn't look fantastic in that mode. At 1080, 30 frames per second, that's what I shot most of the footage on the trail. It did okay, it would get a little blurry on motion. I could move it up to 1080p at 60 frames per second, and I did for some of the cowboy action shooting, maybe some of the muzzleloader shooting, and, and maybe some of the panorama stuff like on top of Tooth and on top of Baldy, but it created a larger file size, so I didn't do that. Um, it made for much smoother motion without pixelation, but um, ideally if I were going back to Philmont today, I could take this, and it takes still pictures as well, 16 megapixel still pictures that turned out okay. It's not a fantastic camera. For 40 bucks, it's a phenomenal camera. But for overall, I'd have been much happier with the higher quality image capture uh, of the GoPro, higher quality audio capture. But for the time we had available to get something quickly, this was cheap and it got to the house in time to take it on the trail. And uh, I bought four extra batteries and then a dual charger that, that's USB powered so we we're able to run it off the battery pack or off the solar panel to charge batteries on the trail and they're little batteries so that all worked out pretty well. I actually lost one of the, the dual charger on the trail so if you found one on the trail enjoy it. Other things that I took for the camera. Okay, a couple USB cables for charging and uh, some zip ties that I actually didn't use, some little Velcro straps. I didn't use this clip-on little ball mount. I figured it'd go on a hat brim or clip onto something. Never found a place that it would have worked to clip that on, so probably shouldn't have taken that. I carried, and this is bigger than I should have carried, uh, and it's only a one amp, five volt, one amp charger. I should have carried one that was stronger, but uh, this is what I grabbed at the last second and actually got to use it at one of the staff camps where they have power. The mayor, they call him, was kind enough to let me plug in there and recharge my battery pack because we'd had overcast for a couple days and I wasn't able to recharge it with the solar panel. I carried, the camera uses micro SD cards. I carried a 64 gig card in it, a 32 gig backup card, and then I had a backup 16 gig that I actually let one of our guys on the crew use and then five batteries, so four in here and one in the camera. And between all that, uh, I only had one day where I was pretty much out of juice and wasn't able to record much because it was overcast and the panel wouldn't charge. All of this stuff I would take again, except I would take a smaller plug-in charger that instead of charging at one amp, it would charge it twice as fast at two amps. That would have been really good. I liked having multiple cables because uh, when, some, when one of the guys needed to charge a phone, I was able to let him do that. I would not take this one. UltraPod really covered all the mounting options I needed, so that was good. Didn't use the zip ties. They weighed next to nothing. I probably would take them anyway. This is an official BSA bag I've had for a couple decades and never used. I used some Velcro ties to strap it onto the hip belt of the Z-Pax Arc Blast and 
and that worked out reasonably well. Other thing I had in here in a Ziploc to try to protect the lens was a waterproof case. I put it in here once when it was raining and that was it because it muffles the audio. I didn't like using it, but I had it in case I needed it. And then the other kind of bonus on this $40 camera was that a remote control. So I had a lot of fun setting the camera up. I couldn't get the remote to work in the video mode, but I was able to do it for still. So I'd set the camera up where the whole crew is sitting eating or like when we're up on top of Baldy and able to get everyone posed and take pictures without having someone else to take the picture. So that was nice. Uh, but I also enjoyed doing funny things behind them and taking a whole series of pictures with me kind of being silly. So, and they didn't know it because I was using the remote control, the wireless remote. So that was cool. Uh, and I kept these, all the camera stuff here on my hip belt so I could get to it quickly on the trail if I needed it. Um, because the Arc Blast doesn't have hip belt pockets, I also grabbed, uh, again, last second, uh, I mean, literally like a few minutes before walking out the door to get on the plane, I uh, grabbed this. It's an old uh, little digital camera case for a small point and shoot camera and used another one of these little Velcro straps uh, to just attach it to the hip belt so it hung there. And what I use this for is I kept my lip balm in there so I wouldn't get my lips uh, sunburned or chapped. And then I had just enough room to put some snacks. So that was awesome to have snacks available they could get to while we we're on the trail uh, there at the hip belt without having to pay the 45 or 50 bucks that z -Packs charges for the pouch that goes on here. Uh, this was not as light as what they make, and I would have liked to have had the lighter pouch, but at the last minute I made the decision to throw these on there, and, uh, and it worked out okay. So... That finally, I think, covers everything on the outside of the pack. Moving on, I think we are finally ready to open the bag. So let's do that. The Arc Blast from Z-Packs has us.